Honorable Rector, faculty members, and my young friends, the students. I'm very delighted that uh, I could come here today and uh, put my signature in this uh, very important document expressing an intention of creating a social business center. I'm sorry that I'm here for only one day. So, and within one day, you kind of get caught whether you want to meet many people or you want to see the country. Uh, it's a, such a beautiful country and beautiful city, but uh, I'm sorry that I didn't have a chance to really look at the city because uh, I'm always inside the room. <laughs> talking to people, and I take a lot of pleasure in doing that, but I'm sorry that I missed out the opportunity. This is my first visit to this country, and I'm amazed by the kind of initiatives that have been taken, and all the history and culture of this country. And looking forward to come back now that um, the Social Business Center is about to be established, that will give more reasons to come back and uh, kind of work together in those ideas. Uh, the reason it becomes very important for me, because I always strongly feel that um, university is the key to the future changes. One of the problems that I faced along the way was a problem of mindset. Very difficult to convince somebody on something new that he or she is not familiar about just because the mind is so made, so blocked. It's very difficult to penetrate in a mind which is blocked out. And that blocking process, mind-making process, comes to kind of a highest point at the university. Because uh, if you can get inside the mind at the university level, you have achieved a great deal because you don't have to have bigger struggle after that. And mindset is something that once it's made is very difficult to unmake. And the world is run by these mindsets. When I was trying to argue that uh, banking can be done in a different way, such an opposition to that idea I said, look, I'm not making it a kind of intellectual arguments. I'm doing it on the ground. We do it. It happens. And people will always have some explanation to discard that. One of the things they usually attack by saying that, well, you show very high repayment rate. These are cooked up numbers so that you impress people. So this is one way to protect your mindset. You don't want to get involved with the issue because you have an ex explanation. When I did it in Bangladesh, we were very small at that time, few villages. When people looked at it and saw that yes, it is something significant they always concluded, well, it can happen to Bangladesh, but it will never happen outside Bangladesh. Bangladesh is a funny country anyway. All kinds of things can happen there. So you don't take it seriously. So after that, you cannot argue. This is not an argument. You simply dismissed because you don't want to 
take these things into action, factor in your mind. So you dismiss that. You are not bothered with it. Your mind is already protected from that. And luckily, some professors from Malaysia were attending Bangladesh conference, a conference in Bangladesh. When they heard about Grameen Bank, they got very enchanted by the idea. So they stayed on. They didn't go back to Malaysia. They stayed on for a couple of weeks just to go deeper into the whole work of Grameen Bank in Bangladesh. And they're so impressed by the work that they saw in the villages, they immediately decided they're going to do it in Malaysia. And they worked very hard. This is the first time the idea from Bangladesh going to someplace else. They worked very hard in Malaysia and made it happen. And they laid out a big program in Malaysia, in Penang. Then when, now I can say, yes, it's not Bangladesh only. There's another country which does it, Malaysia. Well, people came up with their own explanation. Well, it must be something to do with Muslim culture. <laughs> so don't give up. <laughs> Always find something to explain it away. You don't have to deal with it. It's a Muslim culture because this is a Muslim country. Malaysia is a Muslim country. I said religion has nothing to do with it. It's a basic human instinct, that's all. No, no, no. This, it will not work anywhere else. The luckily, after Indonesia, the Indonesia did the second one, it is spread to Philippines. And they became very enthusiastic. They wanted to do it in many, many places and it worked very well. When this information is available, they said, oh, this is something to do with Asians. <laughs> Still protected. So you, you come up with your explanation why it cannot be done. And gradually, the idea of microcredit, microfinance is spread almost everywhere. It was brought to uh, USA very early on, 1987. One governor in the USA, he became very enchanted by this idea. And somebody reported to him how we do the work. So he said he should do it in his own state. This is the governor of Arkansas, Bill Clinton. He invited me to come to Arkansas and see if I can help him set up a grameen program in Arkansas. So I came there, had a long chat, explained everything. He got very encouraged. He said, I want to do it right away. So he seriously wanted it, and he found his colleagues to get around to make it happen. And his wife became very interested. She became the chairman of the committee to implement it, Hillary Clinton. So it began in Arkansas in 1987, called it Grameen Fund. And as it was expanding, after two years, I get a call from Arkansas. Their call is, the question they was raising with me, I said, we wanted to discuss it with you uh, before we take the decision so that you feel comfortable with it. I said, go ahead, tell me what is it. I said, uh, we are going to change the name of Grameen Fund. I said, go ahead, there's no problem with me. I said, no, I have to explain to you why we want to change the name. Every time we try to say Grameen Fund, and people always ask, what is Grameen? So we take about 10 to 15 minutes explaining what is Grameen, what happened in Bangladesh, what, what happened. Then the question is, what is Bangladesh? <laughs> <laughs> so we go for another five minutes explaining what is Bangladesh. <laughs> and Dr. Yunus and say, what is Dr. Yunus? It takes almost half an hour before we come to the real subject. <laughs> and after, after going through all everything, they said, oh, you mean good faith fund, meaning on trust you do things. 
So we decided in the board that we'll change the name, call it Good Faith Fund. So it'll spare us this half an hour of <laughs> discussion. I said, go right ahead, it's no problem. So we, they changed the name and continued. Then it is spread in other areas of the United States, in Chicago, in uh, Lakota tribe region, and Cherokee tribes, all native Indians, and several other places. But gradually it died down. As Bill Clinton left Arkansas because he became president, so he, ran, he went to the White House, next governor came, he didn't pay much attention, and for several reasons. So, so they kept saying that oh, this doesn't work in the United States because people here are so different. What happens in Bangladesh cannot happen in the United States. Our culture is different, our attitudes are different, our economy is different, and people are too independent-minded. They don't want to join groups. They want to do it individually. Every time I get into this controversy, I always say, well, I can hear everything you said. You can go on listing why it cannot be done after you have said it for 10 hours, and I'll say only one sentence. It can be done, only you're not doing it the right way. They said, no, 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 this is not true, you don't understand. I said, well, this is my position. So gradually they were getting irritated. They said, well, why don't you come and do it for yourself? Show us that it can be done. And I took it seriously. I said, yes, you give me the chance, I'll do it to you, for you. So someone provided the money in New York City. So in 2008, January, we started the program in New York City, called it Grameen America, and it worked very well. We continued to expand. Now we have four branches in New York City. There are over 9,000 borrowers in New York City, all women. Average startup loan, first-time loan, is $1,500. Repayment rate over these four years has been 99.3%. So now nobody asked me that question, that it is they are different, they are something, we are, our culture is different, our people are independent. We do it in the most difficult area of New York City. Jackson Heights, we started with Jackson Heights, which is very difficult in Queens. It's difficult because there comes very low income, very poor people live there. Mostly immigrants coming from many different countries. Someone is explaining, Jackson Heights said, if you allow them to fly their national flags on this, any, any block, it will look like United Nations. <laughs> Every country flag will be there. They can't understand each other's language. They don't know each other, they live next to each other for years, but they don't know each other. And there we started Grameen Bank. We sent someone from Bangladesh to come and start it. Because that way you don't have to wait for people to get understanding and so on for years and years and do that. So it's a, he has spent 23 years in Grameen Bank, he knows everything. So when he's coming, he asked me, I never been to the United States. I don't know anything about the United States. You are sending me there. How can I do that? So I told him, look, I'm sending you there because you don't know anything about the United States. <laughs> because if you start knowing about the United States, you'll be confused. <laughs> the quality that you have, you know everything about Grameen Bank. And you just concentrate on Grameen Bank. Forget about the United States. These are just people. That's all. And he took my word for it, he went ahead, it just did exactly he does in, Grameen, in the villages of Bangladesh. His language is the same language that he uses for the villagers. And when he is to form groups, the same problem that I f we face in Bangladesh, it's not easy in Bangladesh either to ask people to form groups. 
but he knows how to explain to people. And they now form groups. They are very happy with the groups. They don't talk about, no, I don't want to be in the groups. So all the question mark that people raised again and again simply disappeared. When you got into the action, action proved everything. And they are so proud of their work. The most difficult thing we had in New York City, just to mention what happens, most difficult thing we encountered in New York City is not with the people. It was with the institution called bank. Because in our system, in Grameen system, not only we lend money, we also require every borrower to save a tiny little money, as tiny as they can. Whatever they can afford, that's the whole idea. So amount is not important. Whatever you can afford, put every week into a savings account of your own. So we have to do it in New York City too. Since we are not a bank in New York City, we are just an NGO in New York City, we cannot pick this money and keep it with ourselves. Law will not allow that. So we have to put it in a bank. We tried every single bank in New York City. Nobody will allow to open a bank account to take deposit of $2 per week because they decided they will put $2 every week. Nobody will accept that. They will just throw away. There's no, can't do that. But we cannot compromise with our rules. We have to uphold the rules that they have to have a savings account, they have to put the money. So we started shaking up the whole system. We started screaming, now that we have a voice, started talking to the press. So we went to the biggest bank in the city, went to their board to, with our plea that, look, this is what we want to do, and your branch doesn't allow us to do that. You have to give us special permission. Seeing the sensitiveness, sensitivity of the whole issue, because if they reject us, we'll go and tell the press. And they won't look good that they are rejected the approach by Grameen program. They could not accept poor people's money. So the board said, yes, we'll instruct the branch to accept your money. We were very happy that we have a permission now with the resolution passed by the board. We come to the branch. Branch says, they can say anything they want, but I'm not going to take it. I can't let these people come into my lobby because they don't look good, because they are coming from poor families. They don't want to see them wandering around in their office. So they had to be pushed by the CEO of the huge big bank to telling his branch manager to accept this $2 deposit. That was the biggest hurdle because we had to move so many people, so many, push so many doors to make it happen. Otherwise, everything worked very well. Two years down the line, after 2008, in 2010, we were visited by a very important person. She looked around, looked at all the things that we did. She said, we want it in Omaha, Nebraska. Can you do it in Omaha, Nebraska? We said, okay, we'll do it in Omaha, Nebraska. You provide us the money, we'll do the job. Same thing we do here. So she immediately said, whatever money you need, I'll give you. So we started two years back, a branch in Omaha, Nebraska. It runs beautifully. Last year, we were invited to open a branch in Indianapolis. So we had another branch in Indianapolis. And that is running very well, too. This year, we are invited to do it in San Francisco. Our branch in San Francisco is two months old now. Next branch is coming up in Detroit, and then Charlotte, North Carolina. The reason I'm saying all this, if you just verbally argue, this cannot exist. Simply will argue it away. But the only way I found that to convince people is to get it done. 
once you get it done, it's very difficult. You try to dismiss it, as I was explaining how it, I was dismissed, that it can be done only in Bangladesh, only in Muslim country, only in Asia. Still, you have to come around to address that issue, why it happens. You can say you are manipulating your number, you are deceiving everybody else. But you can't come up with the concrete evidence. Ultimately, the reality has to win. So I always try to take the path that way, find it much easier to let people understand, let people accept things when it, it is real, rather than in a verbal debate. So that brings me back to the university again, the, re the point that I was taking. Most of the universities are concentrated in a discussion in the classroom. As a result, we create our own imaginary world. And that imaginary world, whether that has any reflection of the real world or not, sometimes become very questionable. When you come out of those classrooms with all the things that you created in your imagination, when you face the world, it doesn't work out. Because your world and the real world has a big gap. And then you do what? You blame the real world. Say, this is wrong, this is not right. That's where your difficulty is. You're not saying your thinking was wrong. Your conception was wrong. You don't blame that. You're blaming what you see because it doesn't fit into your idea. In early years, I came with one realization within myself. As I was teaching in the university, and the reality of the problem in the next door village, extreme poverty, extreme hunger, and I was trying to see if, since I know that economics that I learned has no application to these people, no matter what you say, it has nothing to do with these people. And I realized that in that way, I wasted my time. And in the process, I became a useless person. I'm not useful to anybody because whatever I know is not usable for them. So I came to the conclusion, I said, forget about what I learned. Let's put it back. Why can't I just become a normal human being and try to stand next to another human being and see if I can be useful to him or her in some way, whatever way. I don't know whatever way, but my human instinct probably will guide me because my knowledge doesn't guide me. It doesn't help me anyway. And that was my beginning. And then I was trying to find a person in the village if I can do something to be useful to him or her. And that was my kind of mission every day. I go out and go around, talk to people, see. And that's how I bumped into the loan sharks and the whole story of microcredit began. But the point I was going to make, and not my credit, about my realization and my acquaintance of the village. And after a while, I started telling my colleagues that I have been to the universities and I've done all my work that I'm supposed to do. But now I feel I'm in the real university. The village, the village is my university. I learn a lot from that, which I never learned before. And I'm happy that I'm a student of this village because they tell me, they t teach me the real thing. It's not somebody cooked up, made up stories. These are real. This is their life. And I try to absorb as much as I can. And I see the world completely different way now than I did before. When I came, when I was visiting, when I was trying to explain their life, trying to address their life, I felt like a bird flying very high. And look at them with a the bird's eye view. 
I see everybody, I know everybody, everything, I see everything. And I had the false arrogance in me that I know everything because I see everything. When I was in the village, a sudden realization came to me. I didn't see anything before. For the first time I'm seeing them. What I thought flying high over the sky, what I thought was I was seeing actually is my imagination. I made up those stories, seeing little things, but I made up the stories about people because I didn't see anything clearly. It's a hazy images. And with those hazy images, I made up all kinds of stories about them. Now I see them very clearly, very sharp images. I said, previously I used to have bird's eye view. Now I have worm's eye view. I see things very clearly at a very close range. And I have no mistake. Then things become much more simpler for me. Because now I see where the space, where is the blockage, and how things react. That warm side view has helped me enormously. And I always try to go back to, whenever I try to do something, go back to that, acquiring that warm side view so that I can get it started. If you'll see through my work, there are two characteristics in my work. Now, looking back, I'm just analyzing myself. One, I've done things which I know nothing about. And I did it very comfortably. I didn't worry about it. I didn't worry that I didn't know anything, why should I do it? I did it very comfortably, with a lot of ease, knowing fully well I have no knowledge of this. And banking is one. I have built up a whole new bank, and a whole new concept of banking. I had no knowledge of banking at all. And people ask me, what was the best thing that you had that you could start something like this on your own? I thought about it. And my answer then became, the best thing that ha happened to me was that I knew nothing about banking. Because I realized if I knew about banking, I would just follow the rules that I know. I'll try to improve it a little here, improve it a little, but the structure will be the same. Since I didn't know anything about it, I went ahead and did whatever I wanted. Because my objective was very clear. I wanted to lend money to the poor people, particularly to poor women, and do it in a way so that she feels it comfortable to pay me back and benefits her. That's my objective. And I did everything else to make it happen. And when people ask me, how did you design all those things? I have a very ready answer. I said, whenever I needed some rules, some procedures, I just look at the conventional banks. Once I learn how they do it, I just do the opposite. <laughs> because ultimately, that's what it became. Everything I do is the opposite of the world they do. It sounds funny, looks funny, but that's real. But actually I was not doing that way. I was just trying to do things. How did it happen that it became a mirror image of the conventional banks? It happened because the whole structure of banking is created with the intention, with the policy, that the more you have, the more you can get. So they had to make up everything to support that. And my intention was completely different. I wanted to make the less you have, more attractive you are. If you have nothing, you are the most attractive person. So everything I did automatically became the reverse of the other one. Institutional design, 
practices, way of dealing with each other, dismissing the whole idea of collateral, because that was taken as the very essential core of banking. You have to have collateral. That's what keeps you alive. We dismissed it very casually. Forget it. We didn't worry about it. When we got grown big, conventional banks will ask me, Professor Yunus, can you sleep at night? You're giving up millions of dollars in loans without papers, without collaterals. I said, I have very peaceful sleep. I have no problem. I think you have problem <laughs> with all the lawyers, all the papers. Still, you worry whether your money is coming to come back. I have no worry because I have seen it every day. It happens. Then they will usually ask, what happens if they decided not to pay you back? I said, I don't even think about it because they always pay me back. Why should I spoil my day and night by worrying about something which will never happen? So still, it's done all over the world, done the same way. So this is one part of what I did, not knowing and doing it. Another part is, I always did things in a very small way. I tried to bring it down to as, as small as possible. So every, every work that I have done, I have never started in a big project. I always try to make it tiniest possible component of it. And it worked for me very well. Because once I know how to solve a problem within that tiny little boundary, I develop the prototype. Once the prototype works, it is self-reliant, it is sustainable, and it does the work, does the job done, most exciting thing happens. All I, now all I have to do is to repeat it. And you can, get become, you can become as big as you want. And it started with microcredit, as the story was telling, $27, that's a starting point. But once I learned how to do it in a small possible unit, all I have to do is to repeat that. Now Grameen Bank lends one and a half billion dollar every year. Because just additions of those modules make it happen. People think all this money has to be brought from outside and that will be the limitation where you're going to get the money. I said money never worried me. Because I built the system in a way money comes within the system take the deposits and lend the money. Then another interesting thing happened. Of the one and a half billion dollar that you give out, most of the deposits come from the borrower themselves. People look at the loans, repayments and so on, forget there's the other component of savings. And that savings is a very significant amount. Together, all the borrowers in Grameen Bank today in Bangladesh, in their saving deposit, the balance is nearly a billion dollar. So when we talk about deposits, it's a bulk of the deposits. Two thirds of the deposits are from the borrowers themselves. There are many branches of Grameen Bank. Grameen Bank has a total of 2,600 branches. More than 500 branches where the deposits of the borrowers is much higher than the total loan collectively they have taken from that branch. So it's almost reversal of the whole idea. When the staff of that, those branches referred to them our, we have so many borrowers, we have so many things. I said, please don't refer to them as borrowers. Because you are the borrower, they are the lender. They gave you more money in exchange of much less money you gave them. So net lender is you, uh, a borrower is you.
So the reversal of those things happened. Then I came to saw other issues, health issues, children issues, social issues, and so on. Everything I tried to do it in a very small little thing. And whenever I see a problem, I try to build a business to solve a problem. So in the process, I built many, many companies, more than 50 companies that I built, each driven by their thought that I can create a business to solve that specific problem. Some of them very complicated businesses I got into, again, knowing nothing about it. Like I got into solar energy. I created a solar energy company. The idea is to bring solar energy in the villages because the villages don't have electricity. So while we feel sad about it that we don't have electricity in the villages, and village means in Bangladesh, 85% of our population, that's where they live. So I thought, why don't we create a company to bring solar energy in those villages? So we did that, to bring solar home system. It's not easy to persuade village people to buy solar home system. They have to buy it because this is not a subsidy company. This is not an NGO to give free distribution of solar, energy, solar home system. This is a business. You have to cover the cost. So selling five solar home system per month was such a big task. And moving from five to 10, 10 to 20 was extremely difficult. But we've gone through that difficult process. Now we are at a stage where we sell more than 1,000 solar home systems per day. And the cumulative number of solar home system is just reaching the first million solar home system in Bangladesh. Again, it's a business, but business to solve the problem rather than having any intention of making money. And it works, and it brings us to a completely new dimension of life. So we created many such companies and we started calling them social business. That's where this whole center is all about now. Because we got so used to the idea of one kind of business, business to make money. We cannot even think that one can do business in any other way. And we said, let's try this. If you feel like it, why, who can stop us? It's us to decide we are not going to make money. All we want to do is to solve a problem. So these are non-dividend companies to solve problems. Investor can take back the investment money, but nothing more than that. So we can create social business around any problem that we see. And once we can develop a prototype, this becomes a global property now. You can now, any country can replicate it, any country can ex go on adding, solving their problem because you found the way. Same thing as microcredit, you found the way how to do it, now anybody can do it, it can be done all over the world. If you found a way, a social business, to solve the problem of unemployment for five people, so you're happy that you found a business where five unemployed people have decent income opportunity in that business. The whole business is created for these five jobs. But you may say, so what? If you create five jobs, we need millions. That's the trick. If you know how to create five jobs as a social business, you can do it 500 million, no problem. All you have to do is repeat this now. And each repetition, you'll improve it, refine it, make it more effective. So the power of that repetition, power of that prototype, is so enormous. Why can't the profit-making business do that? In profit-making business, you go into business to make profit. And you have a kind of a floor up to which you expect profit should be ensured. Below that profit, you are not interested in that business. So if you are not getting 
say 20% return on your investment, you are not interested in that business. So for profit-making business, is the profit which drives you to the business. And they say we create jobs. Yes, of course, you create jobs. But job creation is a byproduct. That's not why you created the business. You created the business for making money. Since you cannot make money without having people to work for you, so you create the jobs. In social business, it's the reverse. You created the company to create the jobs. Money making was not your intention because you don't want to take any dividend. All you want to do is a kind of conditionality of the business is that you have to recover the cost. That's the conditionality. So between 20% return below which you don't want to go as a profit making business and 0% return, social business has all this space for creating businesses. Because here, profit-making business will never enter because this is too low. But social business, they will be so happy because they cover the cost. That's the whole purpose. They are not interested in making any personal dividend. So that space can open up a door for many, many, many employment opportunities. So you can start with that. So this is another dimension to social business. And social business is about creative power of human being. How to bring your creative power to solve problems. Didn't we use our creative power for profit making? Yes, of course. We use, continually you use our creative power to make money. But that creative power is dedicated to making money. It doesn't look at the solving problem. Social business opens up this new door. Door to solve problems. Suddenly you see all your creative power, all your technology that you have in your command can be directed into businesses which you never looked at before. That's the challenge. We can redesign the whole system with two kinds of business. One is profit-making business, another is social business. The last point I want to make about the word social. We use this social for many, many purposes. It's a very popular word. People love this word. So we have social enterprise, we have social, business, social entrepreneurship, we have uh, social investments, and many socials. And we have no grudge against any one of them. So we are not fighting with other social and so on, or any other kind of business. Simply we're saying this, the one that we are defining as social business, is a very specific space. It's not any other space, just one very specific space which can be useful in solving problems. If you look at the spectrum of business, on the one side of the spectrum is 100% profit, no social. And then gradually 99% profit, 1% social. And 50% profit, 60% social. 99% social, 1% profit. And then you come to the zero profit, 100% social. That's the space we are talking about. Then begins 1% subsidy, 99% recovery. And go 50% recovery, 50% subsidy, and all the way 100% subsidy, meaning complete charity. So this is the spectrum. We stand right in the middle. And the way I try to explain it, we have a toolbox to address our social issues that we have developed over years. In that we have all these profit maximization, social entrepreneurship, social this, social investments, impact investment, and so on. Everything is there. We are not asking to take off any of those tools out of the box. We are simply saying there is a new tool which is social business, put into the box. See if you can make use of it, if you find happy with that. So that's the invitation we are making. We have made use of it, and we feel very happy about, happy about it. And we see a lot of possibilities about it. You may see the same thing. So we're inviting you to make use of this new tool, to see 
if you can address the problems that we have, we have around us, if you can found it even in a small way, then can play a fantastic role in changing the world. And we have to change the world. We cannot go on the way we are. Because it makes no sense the way we have created this world. I cannot figure out why anybody should be poor. I cannot figure out why any should be unemployment. Why an able-bodied person, a creative person, with a person with tremendous potential, remain wasted away? Is this his fault or her fault? No. Simply, we are not smart enough to create a system where he or she can bring their creativity and make the contribution they deserve to contribute. So we have no escape but to redesign the system. And in that system, nobody will be unemployed. The question doesn't arise. If nobody is unemployed, of course, nobody will be poor. Why should anybody be poor? Because I earn, I earn enough for myself and I contribute to the rest of the world. And I keep saying that we can create a world completely free from poverty. And it could be done very soon. Then we can put poverty in the museum. Because you can't see it in the world anymore. And that's the day we are waiting for. Thank you very much. This was really inspiring and we know now we are, we knew before, but now we are sure we go the right way. Um, before, before we open the discussion, um, we would like to show you a message. Um, it was created by Rifat Sagor from Bangladesh. Okay. And this video message was chosen between, uh, let, it, let us see it.
message. Uh, the invitation was for the young people of the world to send a message to you and answer the question how you have inspired them. And this message was chosen. And um, this whole um, challenge was uh, organized by a world organization called Challenge Future. And I believe they want to give you all the other messages as well. Wow. So, please, come in. Just to say a few words, not many. <laughs> Uh, many times during the out-of-the-box conference, people mentioned that the future belongs to the next generation. So we are standing here on behalf of 24,000 members of Challenge Future community, young people from 214 countries. And Rifat is a friend of ours who was the winner of a challenge of a message to you. We are here on behalf of the youth you were referring to through the whole conference. Youth, which is already trying to create a new, better world for all by encouraging online collaboration, different competitions. We are also implementing impact projects, local hubs, to decrease the gap between the education, the youth, and the business world. So we are here because of 1,000 uh, 469 innovative ideas that the Challenge uh, Future community created and we feel extremely happy um, to have an honor <laughs> to have an honor <laughs> to meet and greet one of the most inspiring persons for us is you Mr. Yunus and we would like to thank you and say that your um, work amazed us and we will continue engaging as many young people as possible in order to uh, continue and our activity and challenge the present and shape the future. And we will never stop learning from people like you. Thank you. We, we, are, we are trying to uh, organize a, a millennium, millennium tour uh, for the young people. The idea of the Millennium Tour is to get the young people involved in owning the Millennium Development Goals so that they start feeling that this is our goal, not United Nations goal only. It's our goal, we'll make it happen. Because if young people take it up around the world, it will happen much faster than anybody else can do. So we'll get back to you to join us in the Millennium Tour. Yes. So that, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for the excellent work you have done. Fantastic. Thank you. Excellent.